There is a single fatal mistake that Go developers with over 10 years of experience still make. I can explain to you this fatal mistake in under 30 seconds, but I suggest you watch this entire video to get an in-depth understanding of how to not run into this mistake. As a pretext for this video, I'm assuming you're at least relatively familiar with Golang and you have some conception of what a Go routine is. And if you're not familiar with Go routines, here's a brief rundown. Go routines are lightweight, concurrent execution units in Go managed entirely by the Go runtime rather than the operating system. And unlike traditional threads, Go routines are cheap to create and efficient to schedule, which allows Go programs to scale to tens or even hundreds of thousands of concurrent Go routines. But it's important to remember that Go routines do have a finite cost in terms of memory footprint. You cannot create an infinite number of Go routines. Okay, but you might be curious, how do these Go routines map onto operating system threads? So the Go runtime scheduler is responsible for multiplexing many Go routines onto a small number of operating system threads, which dynamically manages their execution. While Go routines are significantly more memory efficient than OS threads, where you have Go routines starting with an approximate two kilobyte stack that grows dynamically, they still do consume resources, and thus you cannot spawn an unlimited number of Go routines without running out of memory. So now, here is the fatal mistake. The biggest mistake that Golang developers make is launching Go routines without considering their lifetime and their exit conditions. So in simple terms, whenever you launch a Go routine with the Go keyword, you must know how and when the Go routine will exit. If you don't know the answer to that question, you will get memory leaks, excessive resource consumption, or deadlocks, and a whole host of problems. Okay, but first, let me explain to you the Go routine lifetime. We start with creation or spawned. A Go routine is created when the Go keyword is used before a function call. So this will start execution asynchronously and may run concurrently with other Go routines. The next stage is execution, where it can be in a running state or a block state. The Go routine executes normally, but it may pause if it's waiting for a channel operation, for example, a receive, if it is sleeping, for example, time.sleep, or if it's waiting on a lock, for example, sync.mutex or sync.wait group. And the final stage is termination. And a Go routine can terminate in a couple of ways. The function it executes returns, it encounters a fatal error or panic, the main function exits, which kills all remaining Go routines, or it is explicitly canceled using context.context. .context. So now, how do we actually avoid the fatal mistake? What are some best practices for managing these Go routine lifetimes? So the first technique is using sync.waitgroup to wait for Go routines to finish. So when you're launching multiple Go routines, you want to ensure that they complete before the main function exits. And the sync.waitgroup helps synchronize multiple Go routines by keeping track of how many are still running. The key here is that waitgroup.add1 increments the counter before launching each Go routine, and the counter is decremented when the Go routine completes. Finally, the call to waitgroup.wait .wait blocks the execution of the main function until all Go routines finish, essentially when the counter hits zero. And this ensures that all workers complete before main exits, which prevents premature termination. The second technique is using context.context .context for Go routine cancellation. Go routines run independently and don't automatically stop when the main function exits. But we want to allow controlled shutdown. And in order to do that, we use context.withcancel, which provides a way to signal Go routines to exit. Okay, so here's how we use context.context .context to cancel Go routines. Context.withcancel creates a cancel function. And then inside the worker Go routine, select listens for context.done, which signals cancellation. So the cancel call here triggers the context.done select case, which makes the worker Go routine exit gracefully. And this prevents Go routines from running indefinitely, avoiding resource leaks. If you are interested in taking your software engineering skills to the next level, I would encourage you to build projects. I'm not talking about going down the rabbit hole of tutorial hell and building a to-do list, calculator, or weather app. I'm talking about building complex real-world projects beyond the basics. And this is where CodeCrafters comes in. This platform provides interactive tools to build developer tooling from scratch. There are a number of courses that teach building Git from scratch, building an in-memory Redis database, an HTTP web server, your own Docker, your own DNS server, and many others. I personally love that there is built-in support for over 20 different languages. My favorite, of course, is Golang, but I would highly recommend trying a newer language like Zig as well. I'm excited to announce that I'm partnering with CodeCrafters to offer all my viewers 40% off. 
For more details, you can find a link in the description down below as well as the pinned comment. Back to the video. This next one is pretty important if you've ever dealt with channels. You want to avoid GoRoutine leaks by draining the channels. So GoRoutines will commonly send data into a channel that must have a corresponding receiver, otherwise they will block indefinitely. You always want to ensure that data is received, and you want to close channels when you're done. So here is how we drain a channel to avoid any leaks. In this line, the worker GoRoutine is sending values to the channel, and then we defer closing the channel once all the values are sent. For value in range of channel ensures that all values are received, and this prevents a GoRoutine from hanging indefinitely due to an unreceived message. Early on, I said that we cannot afford to have infinite GoRoutines. So in some cases, we want to limit the number of GoRoutines using worker pools. Instead of launching an unbounded number of GoRoutines, a worker pool uses a fixed number of GoRoutines to process tasks concurrently. And using worker pools, we're not going to have excessive memory usage. So here, the jobs channel holds tasks, and results holds processed output. Num workers limits concurrency to three GoRoutines. Each worker processes jobs from jobs and then stores the results in results. And wakegroup.wait ensures all of the workers finish before executing. So here we're using a combination of a worker pool as well as a sync.wait group. And this effectively prevents excessive GoRoutine creation as well as improve efficiency. So this next one is a very common programming mistake and it's also very subtle and I've personally made it a bunch of times myself. So I feel like it's necessary to call this one out. This one is about avoiding unintentional GoRoutine sharing of loop variables. A super common mistake is using loop variables inside a GoRoutine without passing them in explicitly. And this causes all GoRoutines to capture the same variable reference leading to incorrect values. This code is actually incorrect because I is shared across all GoRoutines. By the time GoRoutines execute, I may have changed leading to unexpected values. Here is the correct code. Func i int explicitly passes i as an argument which avoids variable capture issues. And this will guarantee that each GoRoutine prints the correct value of i. And just to explain why, it's because explicitly passing i as a function argument means that each GoRoutine gets its own independent copy of i at the time of its creation. Otherwise, all GoRoutines would reference the same i from the loop, and i is changing with each iteration, so you get race conditions and unexpected values. And that is it. That is how you address the fatal mistake that plagues a lot of Go developers. If you were ever curious how to build Redis, Docker, an HTTP server, a compiler, or a DNS server from scratch, I would highly recommend you check out Code Crafters, where you can learn how to build these complex developer tooling. This is my absolute favorite project-based learning platform that has support for over 20 different languages, including my favorite language, Go. You can check out the description for a 40% off on all of their subscriptions. And I would highly, highly recommend checking out their building Git from scratch. It is very interesting to learn how to create a blob, how to create a tree object, creating a commit, a repository. So definitely do check out Code Crafters. I highly recommend this platform. As always, thank you very much for watching this video and happy coding.